Welcome back. It's eight o'clock and we are back after intermission. I hope everyone enjoyed that uh, photographic uh, uh, journey through our recent field trips. Uh, that brought back some memories. And uh, wow, what, what, a, uh, what a talented group of uh, photographers we have that, uh, that attend our, our many field trips. Um, and by the way, all of the photos that you just saw um, and many, many more, uh, along with species lists and observation notes, uh, are all can be found in the field trip report section of our website. Be sure to check it out. It's, uh, it's one of the most dynamic and enjoyable sections on the site, and it grows every month. So I hope you will uh, take some time and have a look at that. Uh, now I need to go to a very quick screen share once again. So these are the Eisenman medals. Uh, it now gives me great pleasure to present these, this year's Eisenman medals, two of them, in fact, to Peter R. Grant and B. Rosemary Grant. Uh, Rosemary and Peter, congratulations on this very well-deserved award. And now it is my pleasure to officially introduce tonight's speakers. Uh, but before I do, I should, I should point out that after the presentation, our Vice President, Rochelle Thomas, will be selecting a few questions from the audience. Uh, following the program, please use the Q&A feature, not chat, go to Q&A and uh, at the bottom of your screen. And if you have a question, please send it in to us. Peter and Rosemary Grant have been studying Darwin's finches on the Galapagos Islands since 1973. Their fieldwork is designed to understand the causes of an adaptive radiation. It combines analyses of archipelago uh, wide patterns of evolution with detailed investigations of population level processes on two islands. Genovesa and Daphne. The work is a blend of ecology, behavior, and genetics. The research has been published in four books, most recently, How and Why Species Multiply and 40 Years of Evolution, both published by Princeton University Press. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rosemary and Peter Grant. Right. Hello, everybody. And uh, thank you, Ken, for that lovely introduction and uh, for the invitation to be here. And of course, for the award itself, which is uh, absolutely remarkable and an honor to us. I'm going to just shift the screen so that I can make the first half of the presentation and then I will shift to allow Rosemary to do so. I want you to see the, the medal at the back. <laughs> now, that wasn't scripted. Um, okay. Um, I'd like to start by um, paying tribute to Eugene. Uh, we met Eugene in uh, 1962 at the American Museum of Natural History when we were there to spend a week uh, measuring birds. And uh, Jean had a, a room uh, next door to the bench space that we were allocated. Uh, we remember him as a very warm hearted, very friendly and courteous man. 
um, engaging us in very nice conversation, but also very respectful. Um, he allowed us to work uh, by ourselves um, until such times as his telephone went. And then uh, I have a vivid memory of a loud booming voice coming through to the rest of the room and uh, surrounding us. Well, we miss you, Jean, and I'm just so sorry that uh, you're not here in the audience. The um, view that you are looking at here is of Alcedo, a crater on the western island of uh, Isabella in the um, Galapagos Archipelago. Now, just over the rim, we were um, measuring uh, finches at one time and a tortoise walked straight through the camp. Um, I don't think he or she could have cared less about us, but for many of us, this somehow epitomizes Galapagos. Uh, we are the visitors, they are the owners, we are the guests, and, and you feel that in uh, intimate contact with nature. In the early part of our studies, we went to several islands to uh, explore the extraordinary diversity um, amongst uh, all of its inhabitants. And uh, once again, by living closely in association with nature, uh, an intimate association, um, we were, were made aware of the fact that we were the visitors. And um, uh, I have to say that um, it, uh, you're probably going to ask the question, uh, is that difficult to balance? And I would say, yes, it definitely is a very difficult act to balance. But anyway, there we are in really intimate contact. And here I have a very weighty idea on my mind. So the main reason for us being in the Galapagos was to try to understand the enormous uh, biological diversity in the world, um, as illustrated here with uh, fish from the Great Lakes of Africa, the cichlid fish that are famous for their vast numbers of species. And uh, another example is the anolis lizards in the Caribbean islands, varying enormously in similar ways in color, pattern, size, and so forth. Now, we could have chosen as a group to study the honey creeper finches on Hawaii that was, is a spectacular adaptive radiation like the other two. But sad to say that the archipelago has lost half of these species as a result of human mismanagement of the environment, destroying the habitat on the one hand and introducing disease organisms on the other. So instead, uh, we chose to work on uh, Darwin's finches, a small, a modest uh, radiation, about 18 species we currently recognize that we uh, understand to have evolved in the last uh, one to two million years, relatively recently, as a result of uh, genetical studies from which that inference can be uh, made. It is, as it says, a young radiation in an environment that is um, uh, in very good health. And the radiation took the form of a diversification in beaks, principally. Now, beaks are tools for gathering and dealing with food. And so the, the radiation has been one of ecological uh, diversification in an environment that has uh, been fostered by its remoteness on the one hand and the scarcity of other competitor species and predator species as well. And as the last <laughs> statement there says, it's a dynamic environment. Oh, I should first mention that there are some unique features about the the finch radiation, which makes it, it um, exceptional. Uh, one is the use of a tool to extract cryptic prey. Um, uh, this is a habit of the woodpecker finch. And another habit is a, the bizarre one of uh, poking at the backs of the seabirds, boobies, drawing blood and drinking it. The same species that does this on the island of Wolf in the north of the archipelago also attacks the eggs of these poor hapless seabirds by pecking. And if that doesn't work, they re uh, resort to this alternative stratagem. Now, with regard to the dynamic nature of the islands, um, you're looking at a, a map uh, as if you were looking from the sky uh, downwards. The, um, the, the, the islands owe their origin 
uh, to a hotspot that is currently south of Fernandina in the west. And you have to imagine a plate, a geophysical plate, uh, punctured by volcanic activity, originating from the west and moving very slowly towards the continent at the rate of 60 kilometers per million years. And during that time of one million years, uh, the islands as, as well as the rest of the world have experienced um, 10 full uh, cycles of, from glacial to interglacial uh, disturbances in the weather. And in the Galapagos, this has resulted in the rising and fall, falling of uh, the sea. So at times of the glacial maxima, the sea level uh, went down and the islands apparently rose higher, so they were higher and they were closer together. And in fact, at the most extreme, they, they coalesced into larger, much larger land masses. And then in the interglacial times, warmer times, the sea level um, rose and uh, the islands became apparently relative to the sea level uh, shorter, I mean, uh, less high and uh, more distant from each other. Now, the question therefore for the Darwin's finches is this, how can we explain the origin of 18 species from a common ancestor? Well, the key feature that we need to account for is how one species gives rise to two, which can be diagram shown diagrammatically like this with a splitting um, a diagram uh, of two lineages that diverge until the point at which they can no longer interbreed and we would all say they are two distinct species. How does that happen? Darwin put his finger on a very important point when he said that spatial separation of those two lineages would facilitate the process of divergence. And I'm going to illustrate his ideas, but in uh, our language, with re uh, in relation to the Galapagos. The, the scheme is hypothetical. It takes the form of three steps. First, there is this dispersal to the archipelago. And then there's uh, establishment of new populations on different islands through, again, dispersal and adaptation to the uh, different environments. And then um, the third step is the coming together of previously separated populations, hypothetically, on San Cristobal in the east, where further divergence can be expected under natural selection that minimizes two things. One is competition for food and the other one is hybridization because it is uh, believed that hybrids would be relatively unfit. So it's a process of adaptation by natural selection on separate islands and then a divergence when, when they come together and that divergence or second step in the process is sometimes referred to as character divergence or character displacement. And I'm going to illustrate an example later from our study on this little island of Daphne, where we started our project um, many years ago to address the issue of how speciation, the formation of two species takes place. Here is the island, you've seen already that it's in the center of the archipelago. It's three quarters of a kilometer long, about 120 meters high, and it's never been settled by humans, and therefore it's in uh, natural uh, condition. It's home to four species of finches in the ground finch group. Uh, a small one, a medium, and a large one, and in the bottom right-hand corner, the cactus finch with a relatively long beak. Now I'm going to interrupt the narrative and uh, introduce you to the island to give you an idea of what it's like to be there. Uh, first of all, we put all our, our belongings into quarantine for 48 hours before then uh, arriving and delivering onto the island. Um, in the center of the island is a very large crater with uh, cactus bushes on the side of the crater wall where the finches nest. So the finches go everywhere and we correspondingly must also go everywhere to study them. 
We sleep in a tent of one of the few places that are flat on the outer slope here. We cook in a cave, an open cave that is partly shady. We put up nets as many ornithologists do, capture birds, take them out, they're unharmed by the whole process. And then we go back into uh, another cage, a cave where uh, we have shade and we can then uh, weigh the birds and measure them and band them. And I put on um, a, color, uh, a numbered metal band on uh, one leg um, and three plastic uh, colored bands on uh, the legs also with the colors coded to correspond to the number on the metal band so that when we release the bird, we, if we can read the colored bands, we know which number it is and all about its history. Before we let the birds go, Rosemary takes a little drop of blood for DNA analysis back in the United States, um, much as um, uh, nurses take uh, little drops of blood for DNA analysis and typing uh, of newborn babies in hospitals. So here are the four species diagrammatically shown on a beak width against beak length plot. Um, with all populations of all of the four species represented by av their average position in, their, in the various circles. So we have uh, several populations of the small, the medium, and the large ground finch, and the cactus finch. The main uh, species on Daphne are the medium and the cactus finch, with populations of about uh, 100 breeding pairs in the case of Fortis, and about 50 breeding pairs in the case of Scandins. Fortis, the medium ground finch, is a feeding generalist. We have um, measured um, and banded and released and observed hundreds, literally hundreds of birds uh, to see uh, what they feed on. And from the compiled information, we know that birds seen feeding only on small seeds have uh, small beaks. And those feeding on large seeds have large beaks. So the species is a generalist, but there is to some degree individual specialization according to beak size. The other species, Scandens, is a specialist. All uh, members of the population feed in the same way. They probe a Puntia cactus flowers for nectar and for pollen. And they use their um, chisel-like beak to hammer away a hole in the side of fruits to extract uh, seeds, which they then uh, pr uh, proceed to uh, crack open to get to the kernels on the inside. Now, are these finches evolving now? And how? If they are, and if they are, what does it tell us about evolution? Well, they certainly are evolving. Here is the uh, average beak depth of the medium ground finch population portrayed over 40 years. And during this period, there were two outstanding cases of natural selection, sharp changes in the average size of the beak in 1977 and 2004. Incidentally, I should say that the beak of the finch was published here. Now the two events, 77 and 2004, uh, were different, so I'm going to treat each one separately, but there is a common denominator, and that is a drought which converted vegetation like this into that. The result being um, starvation, mass starvation of uh, the finches and heavy mortality. The first of these episodes occurred in 1977 when the rains failed and 80% of the medium ground finch population died. Now at the beginning, small beak birds and large beak birds survived equally well on a diet of small seeds. But as the as the supply of the small seeds started to decline, the, they had to turn increasingly to large and hard seeds as represented iconically by this 
illustration in the top left, Tribulus is the name of a woody fruit. And only the birds with very large beaks could deal with uh, crack open fruits like that. They were able to crack them open and get the seeds and survive. The small beak birds failing to do so died. And so the average beak size as a result rose until the end of 1977, beginning of 78, when the rains resumed and the vegetation was regenerated. So natural selection had occurred from the beginning to the end of this transition period. Now for evolution to occur, which is a change in the genetic characteristics of the population from one generation to the next, the trait subject to natural selection, beak depth in this case, must be genetically heritable. And that is indeed the case, as we know, by relating the uh, offspring measurements of their beaks to the parental measurements on the um, horizontal axis here. There's a very uh, strong predictable relationship in both species between the offspring measurements and the parental measurements. That line characterizes the relation, predictive relationship with a number varying between zero and one. In this case, it's around about 0.7 to 0.8, close to one, in other words, very high, a very high degree of heritable variation and uh, close to um, the similar heritable variation in our population. Human height has a heritability of a similar magnitude. So as a result of selection on heritable variation, the offspring in the following generation were large like their parents. They had received genes from their parents uh, affecting their size. And so evolution had indeed taken place as a result of natural selection on a trait that was heritably variable, varying for mechanical reasons that we could understand when the environment changed. The second episode that I'm going to describe was set in motion much earlier by an extraordinary El Nino event. Now, El Nino results in enormous amounts of rain in Galapagos. And on this occasion, in 1983, it resulted in a total of 1.3 meters of rain uh, in the course of an very long eight month uh, breeding season, uh, unprecedented according to coral core data uh, in the last 400 years. And then there was a following uh, drought. I'm gonna illustrate the effects of um, the extraordinary El Nino, first by showing you what the island looks like normally in a dry season before the rains come in either January or February or about now in March. Uh, not much green to be seen apart from the cactus. And then the rains come and the island becomes green. And in the foreground is this plant, Tribulus, whose fruits made the difference between survival and non-survival in 1977. Well, that got smothered by an extraordinary amount of growth in the grasses and the herbs and vines in particular, which grew all over everything. They grew over the cactus bushes, they grew over the trees. And so even in the following year, um, when there was no further rain and no uh, photosynthesis going on, you could see the effects of the vines draped over everything. Now, during that 83, very, very wet year, um, the key event that took place was the establishment of a new population of finches on the island. Finches come and go, um, a few stragglers come to the island, then go back when it rains typically in the following year. This time, two female and three male Magnarostris, the large ground finch, stayed to breed. And gradually, as a result of their breeding, the population built up uh, so that by 2004, this bird with a very, very uh, big, deep beak, powerful musculature for cracking the tribulus seed that you can see, or fruit, I should say, that you can see in this one's beak. Um, the numbers built up uh, so much that they had a, 
uh, influence, a competitive influence on Fortis, the medium ground finch. Now here's the Magnarossus in the top right and Tribulus down here. They outcompeted the large beak members of the Fortis population. Here's a small beak member. Uh, they outcompeted these large beaked ones for a diminishing food supply, even as their own numbers were diminishing. These ones were surviving reasonably well, but not very well. These ones being outcompeted for that limited supply uh, suffered disproportionately. So the net result of the natural selection that took place was an increase in the difference in the beak sizes between the, pop, the two species, Fortis and uh, Magna rostris. Um, uh, as you see, with a great uh, drop, a very sharp precipitous drop in the size of the beaks uh, on average in the Fortis population. And thereafter, they stayed the same. And we know, um, as I mentioned earlier, this is an example of the character displacement that I uh, mentioned at secondary contact uh, of uh, previously separated populations. And we know from various lines of evidence that there was a genetic change in the population. And I'm just going to summarize one line of uh, reasoning that comes from collaborative work done with uh, two people from Harvard University, developmental geneticists, uh, Cliff Tabin and Arkad Abshanov. So by uh, using uh, standard techniques in developmental genetics, they establish that each dimension of the beak is governed by different expression patterns of different genetic, along ge different genetic pathways. For, uh, let's start with the one on the left here, BMP4, bone morphogenetic uh, protein number four, is a signaling molecule that affects beak depth uh, during cartilage development. And calmodulin down here is a, uh, another signaling molecule that effect, affects uh, the development of beak length. And width, independent of the other two, is affected by a different genetic pathway shown up here. It's expressed after coat cartilage has condensed into bone. So now I'm going to draw uh, conclusions before handing over to Rosemary. In the first instance, I showed you that natural selection occurs when the environment changes. It's basically support for the Darwinian proposal of stage one in the model. And then secondly, other species determine the direction of evolution, which is the second step in the model occurring when two previously pop uh, separated populations come together. And both of these then are core ingredients of speciation, how species form. But that's not the only way that species could form, as you will hear from Rosemary. This is the easiest point to get onto the island, I should say. So Peter has shown you one method of speciation, and I'm going to talk about another method of speciation, which involves very rare gene flow between the species. So genes passing from one species into another, which occurs very rarely. And then I'm going to tell you about one of the most exciting parts of our study, which is um, the um, formation of a new lineage, which we have followed from its inception all the way up through six generations. But to look at this, first of all, we've got to ask what are the pre-mating barriers to reproduction between the species? And why is it that this barrier very occasionally leaks? Well, to look at the pre-mating barriers, um, we can't use plumage because all Darwin's ground finches are similar in plumage. Males are black, females are brown. They all build similar nests, like these dome nests down here. They all, um, as far as we can tell, have very similar courtship behavior. And they differ in two respects. They differ in song, and they also differ, as Peter has shown you, in size and beak shape. Now we can easily recognize the birds this way, but the first thing that we had to do when we went to the islands was ask, can the birds also discriminate between their own and another species on these characteristics? 
So to do this, um, first of all, uh, to ask can individuals discriminate between their own and another species purely on appearance in the absence of song, what we did is we took two stuffed museum specimens, a female um, fortus, um, stuffed museum specimen of female fortus, put it on one end of a branch and the female scandens on the other and took this into the territory of a living territory owner at the very height of the breeding season. And found that the territory owner vigorously quartered a female of his own species and completely ignored the other one. And we did this many times and we did it with controls. And then we asked, can individuals discriminate between their own and another species on the basis of song in the absence of any morphological cues? So we recorded song, played back Porter's song. Porter's came into the loudspeaker, Scandon's completely ignored it. Played back Scandon's song, Scandon's came in and Porter's completely ignored it. <clears throat> so clearly they can discriminate in the same way we can on the basis of song and appearance. And song turns out to be very important. It's very different between the species. This is a typical Porter's song, a modulated song where Scandin's song is a series of repeated notes. There's individual variation within a species, but it's always on this species-specific song theme. <clears throat> we also know from work done by Bowman in the 1950s that um, on captive birds, that song is learnt from the father during a very short receptive period early in life between day 10 and day 40. This corresponds to the last few days in the nest and when the birds are out of the nest being fed by the parents and all this time the male is singing. So it's not too surprising that the birds learn perfect or the male learns perfect rendering of the father's song and the females we know from the way they mate is that also learn um, the father's song. So once learned, the song is retained for life. And as adults, they pair according to their species specific song, which is learned early in life. So we can ask how robust is this pre-mating barrier? Because after all, it is based on song, which is learned. Therefore, it is vulnerable to disruption if a young bird hears and learns a song of another species during its short sensitive period early in life. And this does happen, and it happens um, for a typical reason that it happens is when the father dies. The females don't sing. And so if the next territory is owned by another species and the male is singing that's his species song, then the birds will learn that, hear and learn that song. So we have very few birds. It happens about 1% of the breeding season, but we have a few birds that have learnt another species song. So we wondered whether this would lead to hybridization and the colonization of Magna Rostris, which Peter told you about, was a way to test this. So we had Magna Rostris, as Peter told you, had arrived and then built up this population. It's a bird that is twice the size of Fortis, which is roughly 17 grams. This is a bird of roughly 32 grams. And it's extremely aggressive and it's a very loud song. <clears throat> so over the years, we had eight Fortis and two Scandons that had learnt and sang a Magnarostris song. A Magnarostris song is an example of the sonograms here. This is a Magnarostris song. This is a typical Fortis song, and this is one of the Fortis that sang a Magnarostris song. Typical Scandin song, one of the Scandins that sang a Magna Rostris song. <coughs> now, none of these bred with the Magna Rostris. And the reason was they'd learned this song and next year when the breeding season came around, these little birds opened their mouths and sang a Magna Rostris song. And a Magna Rostris whipped in as if from nowhere and just beat them up. So it never got anywhere. And None survived to breed with a Magna Rostris. <coughs> um, so we thought that when the size difference is very large, the barrier is really robust. 
Even learning another species song didn't lead to hybridization. But it's a very different matter when the size difference between the species is small, as it is between scandens at about 22 grams and fortis about 17 grams. Then learning another species song can lead to hybridization. Again, this happens very, very rarely, but we were left with a few of these birds that had hybridized. And we were wondering how well did the hybrid survive? Were there, was there any genetic incompatibility? Oops. So, um, and how fit were the hybrids relative to the parental species? Well, for the first 10 years of our study, we followed these few hybrids and none of them survived the dry season in order to breed the next year. Now, we didn't know if this was because of genetic incompatibility. Scandins and Fortis are not sister species. Um, so that was possible. But also these dry seasons were extremely dry with very little food. And we thought, well, maybe they're so dry there is not enough food. And this was a possibility because many of the birds were dying. And this seems to be the case because after this extraordinary El Nino that Peter told you about, the most severe in 400 years, according to coral core data, the island was transformed from a large hard seed producer to a small soft seed producer. And under these conditions, the hybrid survived. But we could still ask how well did the hybrid survive relative to the parental species? So this is the survival um, this is in 1983 when we had well over a thousand fortis produced and um, over 500 scandins produced and actually 12 hybrids. And, but this is the survival curve for the parental species, fortis and scandins, for the next three years when a, there was a large amount of rain produced. So how well did the hybrids survive born at the same time? And the answer is in blue here. They survived as well as, if not better than the pure species. So in this altered environment with now an abundance of small soft seeds, plenty of food, there's no evidence of any genetic incompatibility. They produced as many eggs, as many offspring and as many recruits. So how did they meet? How did they pair up? Well, they followed the rule. They mated according to the species song that they learned early in life. So as a result, between these two species, Fortis on one hand and whoops, Scandinavians on the other, there was um, genetic exchange both ways. So first of all, with Scandinavians um, genes going into Fortis, the average beak shape of um, Fortis became more pointed and more scandens like and stayed that way. And then most of the, after this, most of the crossing was going from Fortis into Scandens and Scandens beak became progressively blunter and blunter and blunter over the next 30 years and much more Fortis like. So we were able to track, when Peter and I were first doing this, we were able to track these usually in rather a coarse way of doing um, genetics, but we, it was enough to show us that genes were flowing from scandens um, into fortis and fortis into scandens, and that the two species, fortis and scandens, were converging on each other genetically. And they were also, to, as a measurement showed, converging on each other morphologically. Another way of looking at this is looking at the beak shape difference, which was large before hybridization. And then after hybridization, it got progressively more and more and more similar. And if you extrapolate, if everything goes on as it already has done, you can extrapolate up, up to, I think, 2047, when they should be almost identical. So they're in the process of becoming a single breeding population, which is made up of birds with rather small pointed beaks that are extremely efficient at dealing with small soft seeds. Now, we wanted to know if there were specific alleles that could have contributed to this change of beak shape. So we collaborated with Leif Anderson and his lab group in Sweden. 
And they took all our blood samples, they sequenced them all, and they found a very interesting gene. It's a gene that is um, known to be um, involved in cranial facial development. It's a transcription factor, which means it trans transcribes DNA into RNA. And it's very important in humans because a mutation in, at ALX1 is largely responsible for um, cleft palate in humans. In our birds, it comes in two forms. It comes in one that is associated with blunt beaks, and we call it ALX1B, and another that is associated with pointed beaks, which is um, in scandals, which we call ALX1P. And they were able, with our blood samples from before and after hybridization, to track these genes going across. So that's a short summary of actually a very long process. Um, and as I said before, these now small pointed beaks are really efficient at dealing with small soft seeds. And both Fortis and Scandins have acquired this new combination of genes so that the population is very different now on Daphne than it is between Fortis and Scandins on other islands. So the genetic and morphological variation has increased enormously in both populations, but these are, it says Scandins, all these birds were taken out of the net, same net in 2012. The bird at the Scandins at the top has a long pointed beak with measurements that are identical to measurements before hybridization. But these two birds you can see are much blunter in beak and they have the ALX1 blunt, um, allele from Fortis and a much more Fortis like. So, this leads us um, onto the formation of the new lineage. How did this occur? Well, it occurred when we had all birds banded on Daphne, and a bird arrived on the island, and it looked very much like a blown up Fortis. It was large, it was 28.5 grams, Fortis is 17 grams. It was young when it arrived, but when it next year, when it started to sing, it had a completely unique song, never before heard on Daphne, and we banded it 5110. Um, a genetic analysis showed that it was um, confirmed it was a conirostris that came all the way from Espanola. We don't know how, but it arrived on Daphne, and it stayed. It was because it was a big bird, very robust, it managed to get a superb territory, but it couldn't get a mate. It, after all, had the wrong song and it was the wrong size and the wrong shape. And it tried for two years. And then at the end of the second breeding season, um, a female fortress had lost her mate and she went into this beautiful territory owned by 5110, mated with 5110 and produce some offspring. And then the following year, another fortress did the same. And so we followed all the offspring. All the offspring had genetic transmission from 5110, which we were able to tell from our blood samples. And all males sang 5110 song, which was passed from father to son. So grandfather, father, son. And then along came the two and a half year drought that Peter told you about. And all these birds died, leaving just these two. And these two were a brother and a sister, an inbred brother and a sister. Two and a half years later, when the rains came back, the brother and sister bred with each other. They produced 26 offspring and all but nine of them bred. So we had a daughter breeding with her father, a son breeding with his mother, and the rest of the brothers and sisters breeding with each other to produce the next generation which bred with each other to produce the next generation. Again, from our blood samples, all birds showed genetic transmission from 5110, and all males sang this 5110 song, and all were large, like 5110. So the genome-wide inbreeding coefficient went steadily upwards, but there's still actually quite a lot of um, genetic variation in the population. 
because after all, it had started through hybridization, started with an extraordinary amount of genetic variation. But what was really interesting was that um, the big, what we now call the big bird lineage in blue didn't lie directly intermediate between Fortus in green and Conirostris in red, but it was displaced. And so it had a large bill on a relatively smaller body. Now it was in the dry season, it would go around with Magna Rostris and it would crack tribulus seeds. So we were wondered how efficient it was compared with Magna Rostris at cracking these tribulus seeds. And by measuring the cracking time from the time of picking up to opening the seed, um, we found that they were just as efficient, this is big bird in purple lineage, they were just as efficient as Magna Rostris and far more efficient than Fortis, which is now very small and can really hardly crack these tribular seeds. So if there was another drought, and as it was in the last two really severe droughts and tribulus was left, the big birds should have a, a good advantage because not only are they just as efficient as Magna Rostris at cracking the tribulus, but having a smaller body, they um, will require less food. So the new lineage is behaving as a separate species for three reasons. First, it's much larger, it differs in size and portus its nearest relative. In morphological space, it's, um, it lies here. If we look at beak length over beak depth, this is where Magna Rostra's population lies. This is the portus population and the big bird lies here intermediate, which is the gap that opened up when Magna Rostris outcompeted the largest fortis for tribulus seeds in the characters displacement event that Peter described. It has a completely different song. This is three generations of the big bird song, very different from fortis song, Scandin song, and Magna Rostris song. It holds contiguous territories in one side of the island. The blue dots are territories before the drought, the red dots are territories territories after the drought. And these territories, they defend against each other, but the territories overlap the territories of Fortis, Scandins, and Magna Rostris, who they ignore and are ignored by them. So in all respects, the new lineage is functioning as a separate species. Will it die out through inbreeding depression? Well, it might, but no sign of it yet. Will the genetic variation be augmented through gene exchange? Again, by learning another species song, it might, but again, no sign of it yet. Whether it survives or not, this new lineage gives us insight into how a new species could arise and either persist or become extinct. So in summary, when we first went in 1973, there were two very distinct um, species on the island, there was Fortis and Scandins, and it stayed this way for 10 years. Then in 1983, with a huge El Nino effect, hybrids began to survive and back cross and Fortis and Scandins began to converge on each other. Magna Rostris came in at this time, outcompeted the largest Fortis, which lay up here, and the big birds came in there. So Darwin, in his notebook um, in 1837, drew his diagram when he was thinking of um, speciation and how species were formed. And this is a sort of rather crude phylogenetic tree. And he wrote, I think, would he now join up some of these um, indicating in hybridization in, in progression and write, I now realize, well, maybe. So what we have shown is we have shown um, that um, two methods of speciation, one Peter showed you, which is lineage splitting in exactly the way Darwin envisaged. We have also shown through the results of introgression gene flow forming in the big birds, a completely new lineage. So two methods of speciation. So how important is gene flow between species? How important is it as a source of variation for adaptations to new environment? When we first started to publish this about 30 years ago, it was considered it might occur in plants, but definitely not in animals. And 
But now we know that it is extremely important. It occurs in bacteria. It occurs in plants, some beautiful work by Lauren Riesberg and Richard Abbott, and also in all, um, in all genera of animals, everything from fish all the way up to humans. And Svante Pavel has shown that it was a source of variation used in adaptation in our own lineage. So there was intergression between Denisovans, Neanderthals, and early modern human lineage. Um, the variation used in adaptation is thought to be res responsible for us being able to move both into um, Europe and into Asia. We know it is important in cancer clone evolution, which takes place within tissue ecosystem habitats. And I can talk more about this if anyone's interested. And also, um, again, um, introgression between different lineages of cancer has been very important. It is also just only, um, I think, three weeks ago, the, uh, the, a paper came out to say to show that the genomic region associated with protection against severe COVID-19 is also inherited from Neanderthals and was passed to our early humans early on. So we thank our many graduates, postdoctoral fellows, and particularly our collaborators, uh, support we get we got from the National Parks and the Charles Darwin Research Station and our funding. But I just want to leave you with one message. And this um, NASA image of our world captures the uniqueness and the fragility of our planet with biodiversity being its fundamental feature. We have shown you that environments and populations are dynamic, they're constantly cha changing, and for a healthy environment, we absolutely must keep them both capable of further natural change. Thank you. Peter and Rosemary, thank you so much. That was an amazing presentation. Um, I'm going to take a second and let everyone populate the Q&A with their own questions. I wrote down about 45 of my own. Oh, I'll ask maybe <laughs> maybe my top three. Um, and thanks for leaving on a conservation note because I think that's like these issues of, you know, island biogeography lend themselves to, uh, it's sort of, we extrapolate a greater conservation message because these are very, very small ecotones in which we are like using experiments. But my first question I have to ask is, a, is this person with a very, rudimentary understanding of uh, uh, evolutionary biology. I, 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 when I was watching the presentation, I couldn't help but think, you know, how do you field questions about, well, this is small population genetic drift. Like this is something that's bound to happen in this sort of ecosystem. And like, how, how do you then say, oh no, it, it's definitely a, a natural selection. Well, maybe I should answer that one. Uh, the, the two are not in opposition. Um, the random drift, uh, a chance of uh, changes in the genetic constitution of a population from uh, one generation to another is, is happening the whole time. Uh, we know that. A, a question I think that you, uh, if I can rephrase it just a little bit, how do we know that it's not just entirely random processes that are uh, creating the differences that we see? And the answer is um, what I was uh, outlining at the beginning um, of two very strong uh, events of natural selection. And it's very difficult to believe that these are the only ones. I mean, uh, we've, we've, we've often been asked, um, uh, are you sure that um, this is something that you were just lucky to get? Or uh, is it an ongoing uh, likelihood, likely process? And I... Uh, I can't believe that in, we picked the 40 years in which the only two natural selection events occurred or that the big bird lineage was formed as uh, on its way to forming a new species. The only time in the history of one to two billion years where this has happened, it's, it's just uh, too incredible to, to be uh, sustained. So no, I, the, the, the long and the short of it is, I think both selection and random processes are jointly affecting the evolutionary trajectories. 
of and these populations. Well, there are two, two things going on with drift going on um, uh, all the time, but to get a really big change from one generation to another, you cannot get that with such a big change just with the, the drift. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's very clear, but I had to ask because the first question we have is written by someone whose textbook I actually read cover to cover and had the greatest explanation of genetic drift. I always think about it, but their question is, um, the big bird story is very interesting. I know of two cases of bird species that originated by hybridization. Is there any indication that any other Galapagos finch species originated by hybridization. Do you know of any other instances? Great talk, by the way. Um, yes, <laughs> we do know We do know that hybridization is going on. And we did a, a, a study on Hennebasa um, for um, 10 years, and there was hybridization going on there. And also, we have looked at um, the genetics, and we do see that um, this hybridization is actually um, going on at a very low level. So this is, it's not just unique to, da to um, Daphne, it's mm. going on on other islands as well. So yeah, but I would add that with regard to the formation of a new lineage, we don't have any other case. We don't have any other uh, example. It um, is likely to be very rare, requiring special circumstances. My own hunch is that it would require a small island population, so not a big one. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's not as if we have um, an army of uh, 30 graduate students and helpers on the different islands, all waiting to see if there was uh, natural selection occurring or the formation of a new lineage. It, that's another way of saying that we're very ignorant about what's going on on the other islands in the archipelago with very small number of exceptions. I'm gonna, there's another really fun question, but I have to ask um, what has COVID done to, like how has it disrupted research in places like the Galapagos? Because that was something I was thinking about when you were talking and whether there are some researchers who are going to miss one or two years and in in a case where you have such a rapid um like adaptive radiation potentially happening how would you think that would affect well know, this, future data? yeah yeah i mean it we Galap both want to talk <laughs> Sorry. the galapagos research has stopped completely um there's there's no research going on uh, um on in the galapagos um now i mean it's affected it's affected um, well, all the people doing field work in Princeton, for example, or the graduate students and the faculty doing field work, that's all had to stop. Yeah, yeah it was, it yeah, was completely all, stopped. all activity was frozen. I just have a, a couple of comments to make. First of all, how lucky we were to be mm -hmm. born when we were. So that because if we were in the middle of a research, long term research project uh, now, 2020, uh, not able to carry on. Uh, we would lose the continuity that's been so valuable for understanding uh, change that takes place and um, not only um, the change itself, but also the environmental circumstances that have caused it. That's my first comment. We're exceedingly lucky that uh, we, we have not been to the island since uh, 2000, I mean, doing work on the island since 2014. The second comment is following up Rosemary's remark. Um, there is an ongoing research project on the Western Island uh, trying to sustain the population of an endangered mangrove finch. And that unfortunately had to be, that project unfortunately had to be put on hold for a year. Uh, a, a crucial un, uh, stoppage, unfortunately, because um, the population really needs uh, human help. It's uh, on its way uh, towards extinction without help because of, for a number of reasons, one is the habitat and, um, and the other one is, um, um, uh, that's the main one. I just leave it at that. Yeah, no, there's a, the New York Times actually published a study, or a, not a study, an article today about the pros and cons of what we are calling the anthropause on, you know, wildlife. There's this sort of uh, boon for, you know, uh, a, a pause in tourism, but there's also, a huge con and so researchers aren't able to get the sites and so 
I'm, yeah. I'm personally involved in a very long-term study with snow geese. It's been going on for 50 plus years and that's, you know, maybe it's curtains. And so it's really, it, I think people don't understand that, you know, COVID has an impact on a lot of these long-term data collection studies that are really, really crucial to our understanding of the world in a, in a greater sense. So. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And we have uh, 25 graduate students in our department who do overseas work and they could, we would probably be saying if they were listening here, I agree. <laughs> I think it's uh, the message and this is a pretty small audience, but it would be fund these researchers so they can really get going the minute they're back out in the field. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask a really fun question. I, the audience, I, I really appreciate every time we talk, they ask a sort of a combo of very deeply contemplative scientific type of questions and then super fun ones. I mean, the obvious question all of us want to know is the next time we go to the Galapagos, can we visit, you know, your site and we want to go with you. Can you be our guide? We know that's not the case. <laughs> But someone is asking, do you miss sleeping in a tent on rocky ground? Do you set up a tent in your backyard now? Yes, we do, but I don't know whether I don't know whether the person who asked that question thinks we uh, do miss it for good reasons or bad. I just love being in the field and camping, even if it's on rocky ground, because the body somehow molds itself to the ground up to a point, up to a point. What yeah, what well, do you say? Well, <laughs> Yes, I mean the the rocky hatch, the rocky ground on um, Daphne is not very comfortable because it's on a slope as well. <laughs> so, but um, but no, we do we can usually manage to by just bolstering it up with with um, clothes and things that we can make it flat. Oh but, gosh, I'm imagining first night on the slope. It's like you must have you probably laid the wrong way, so your head was down slope, and you're like, no, 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 and then <laughs> no, you, that, no, 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 that's not yes. <laughs> but you you do you either roll into each other or you roll out of the tent or you yeah. <laughs> so no, we because we spent we spent months in the there. So um, and usually people ask this, and I usually say that when we get back, the first fresh food is wonderful, and the first hot shower is absolutely absolutely fantastic because we're washing most of the time in seawater, and it, it's so a fresh water shower is just fantastic and then you have that and then you want to go back straight away <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. it's actually like a perfect experiment like it sort of parallels our covid lives like a fresh yeah. shower during covid also feels i think it equally as good but yeah. that's just me but yeah. um and please, I just want to, the audience, please populate the Q&A with any questions you have. I'm just going to move on to another one that is inspired a little bit by, this is a very, um, the Linnaean Society there is, is rich with people who are very, very good um, uh, birders who um, are very, very good identifying bird song. I am able to basically identify a cardinal. I feel great about that. Um, but I was curious about some of the things you talked about where the, the songs had completely changed in one or two generations and because it is a learned song, did you get, did you get um, any sense that there are birds who are singing via mimicry parts of songs because of proximity to other populations or how does, how does, how is song so clearly differentiated in such a small space? I know it's this is actually a really interesting uh, problem and I, I was talking to somebody who um, does a lot of the neurological work about song because on um, the, as you could see from the sonograms that Darwin's Finch songs are extremely short so they're they're very short and they um, and they as I say learned uh, um, just in this very short sensitive period as well um, but the it they will learn other finch songs in the way I described if the, if the male dies and they hear another finch song, but there is a yellow warbler there and they don't even attempt to learn a yellow warbler song or um, anything like this. They don't learn seabird songs, but they do sort of learn, it's almost as though there's a template for um, finch songs that they, that they learn. Um, so it's it's something that actually I was talking to um, 
to, to somebody who does work on this and uh, he was saying exactly the same we don't know why this is so but this is actually rather typical of some birds and and also of course there's um about well half the birds learn the songs half don't but amongst the birds that do <clears throat> do learn songs then there are some like darwin's finches and the uh, the zebra finches are the same learning songs in just a short period and then will not learn anything after that period is gone and then then there are others of course like mockingbirds that learn throughout night life and the thrashers that learn throughout life and actually extemporize um so we have this ho whole gradation of um, bird song and a lot is known about the song centers in the brain and when they're open and when they're closed and Darwin's finches are one of these that are basically closed learners that they can only learn in a very short part of the time. But why they can only learn other finch songs and not uh, things like yellow warbler songs, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think bird song is really, really fascinating mm -hmm. and um, something that's, that, that there's just so much research people can do in this field alone. and you know, how it becomes almost another morphological consideration when you talk about genetic differentiation or variation. Um, someone just wrote in, they wanted to know what is the average lifespan of the finches? Oh, the average, well, of course, uh, most, most will die when they're young. So the average is about four years, but they can live for as long as 17 years. Is it more like if they make, I, I know with a lot of bird species, if you make it through your first year, your, your ability to survive skyrockets. Exactly, that's exactly right. It's the same thing. If you can make it through the first year, then you, so the average, you know, if you take all that as an average, the average comes right down. But if you make it through the first year, quite a number of birds will live till 12 years. And of course, the other thing that happens, we have these periodical droughts and then in the droughts, as many as 90% of the birds can die. So then, and what is extraordinary is that once the bird that has made it through the drought, then it, they live quite long. You know, they, once they've got, they've made it through that drought. But then there are very few that make it through the drought. Yeah, it's, it's sort of amazing that it's, it's really survival of the fittest, I guess, you know, um, maybe. Well, survival, if you, if you have the right apparatus and the, I mean, if you're, you know, if you have a big beak at the time when there are big seeds, then they will survive. Um, there's a, there's one, sometimes I show this film, particularly if I'm talking to an audience of, of children, small children, but um, in that, um, in the, um, the situation that Peter told you about where um, the Magna Rostras outcompeted the large fortress for the tribulus seeds. And so the survival in the fortress, the small ones were surviving. They were surviving when there was practically no food at all. And what they were doing, and I have a lovely little film of this, is they were going along by a Magna Rostras that was cracking a tribulus seed. And as they crack the outer seed covering, then all the, the little seeds fall out. And the, these little birds were following them. And just as they cracked them, they would pick up the little seeds. Oh, it sounds amazing. And I want to say uh, that- So behavior, the, the behavior flexibility is very, very important. I think, you know, I think that maybe when we return to the museum, maybe you can come back and meet us all in person or at, at, at next function and show us the film because it sounds wonderful. Um, I'm gonna just ask one more question or maybe two and then I'll let you go for the night. Thank you so much for staying. It's pretty late. But I I was sort of I was curious about the I mean this is sort of a funding question, especially in this age. Yeah. But were you do you are you able to capture full genome sequences of any of the birds? Are you doing more of like a SNP analysis? What what is what's what? the sort what are the parameters of you know expense or or whatever you can do with the time? Well, what we were well, fortunately what we did after, not at the very beginning, but after um, in the 1980s, uh, we took very small blood samples and we did microsatellite work, first of all, which is very a very coarse grain one. But with, um, our, with Leif Anderson's lab in Sweden, he has done 
full genome analysis. And we have just heard last week that every single bird that we have blood samples for, and that's thousands on Daphne, have all been fully sequenced, absolutely fully sequenced. Um, like two years ago, we went down to, um, to the Galapagos with him and we took the Oxford nanopore sequencer down with us. And so we were able to do these long read sequences. So we have many of the birds with um, long, really long read sequences. And then the others have all been completely sequenced. So, oh, we, that's, so I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible really. Yeah. It really is. And I think it's such a gift for the future to be able to capture these sequences now. In, yes in this capacity. So that's wonderful. Yes. Um, I'm going to just end, I'm going to pass it back to Ken in a second, but I just, I know you just said that your research ended in 2014 on the island, but were you continuing to visit the research site on an annual basis? And do you think you'll be able to go back? Yes. Well, we plan to go back next year. We were going to go, we were going back this year and that was canceled. Um, the plan is to go back next year, um, and uh, we've um, we've got to get permits, of course, each year. And but th that's our plan um, to go back next year. And as I said, we were there two years ago, and um, actually two and three years ago. Um, so we know that the big birds are still there. <laughs> so yeah, we um, want to we want to go back and find yeah, out how many yeah. are, are alive, what they're doing, yeah. uh, in, what what they're whether they've expanded in numbers or collapsed to a very small number or what 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 has been their fate, and um, uh, so we have the plans to have a couple of assistants working with us and uh, doing full genotype work as part of the exercise, and. Uh, it, the thought occurred to me that in answer to um, one of your previous questions, um, a good answer would be um, we started studying finches and we've finished studying genes. <laughs> it, it's just truly remarkable that we're doing something that we'd never even conceived of doing at the beginning. If, if, if somebody had said, you know, 40 years time, you'll be sequencing the whole of the genome of all of the individuals on your island, um, I will say, uh, have you been hallucinating? <laughs> but we were so lucky to actually keep the, the little blood samples that are on <clears throat> filter paper. So it's really just a drop, you know, it's just a tiny drop. And it's amazing that, you, and the nice thing about birds is the red blood cells are nucleated. So you get a huge amount of DNA out of blood, much more so than humans, for example. And um, so that's, that's, been, that's been absolutely huge, yeah. I think that's a wonderful way to leave it, that really, um, despite everything that's happened, it is a wonderful time to be alive and that we are living in an age where amazing scientific things are happening every day. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, here, well, here. I mean, like the, the, the thing that I ended up with this paper just um, two or three weeks ago showing that, um, the gene that um, helps with COVID actually came from Neanderthals. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I think I'm pretty much maybe 40, 50% Neanderthal, so I'm, I know I'm set. So it made me <laughs> very good. So did you get yourself... Um... <laughs> I did, I did. Mine was like average to high, but I, I know that it was, I'm going to have it done again, because I know it's probably off the charts. I'm very strong, I, I'm very robust, you know, and yeah. in the way that I think that I... I will, I will survive COVID because of my <laughs> Neanderthal genes for sure. But. Well, I, yes, I, I, I think I keep on thinking that Peter and I should do this. Yes. Oh yeah. It's really, it's a lot of fun and you'll find relatives you wish you had never found. That's yes, nice. Yes, I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you both again. This was a wonderful talk and we're going to post it on our website for people to be able to enjoy for you know, months to come who weren't able to enjoy it tonight. We did have this only for our members. So this will be an option. I know I'm currently a student at Columbia in the evolutionary uh, evolution and ecology and conservation biology department. And I'm sure many of them will want to watch it. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it back to Ken. So thank you so much. Thank you. Very thank you. Much. Thank you. 
Rosemary and Peter, thank you kindly for such a <laughs> in-depth fa and fascinating uh, uh, presentation tonight. It's uh, it it's very uh, it's very good to know that the story continues, and uh, I I I do hope that you make it back to the Galapagos. And I know that I I'm probably speaking for everybody that's still uh, listening. We would love to hear any follow up uh, as your as, as as your research continues. Uh, so I wish you well with that. Please uh, keep us in mind for maybe a future talk at some point. Um, I want to thank Rochelle for her expert uh, Neanderthal uh, moderation of tonight's, <laughs> of tonight's Q and A. Uh, Rochelle, you outdid yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you kindly. And I also want to thank everyone who tuned in. Uh, please, uh, please remember that um, there will be an email coming to you tonight. Um, you, your vote is very important to us. So we look forward to you responding to that email. Um, and um, again, Peter and Rosemary, thank you very much. Uh, and um, I wish uh, everyone uh, good health, good birding, and a good night. See you next thank, month. Thank Our you. Thank you very much. And Our opportunity to thank you for the invitation to do to meet you, even if it is a virtual meeting rather than an actual meeting. Thank you very much. Thanks. Well, hopefully next time it will be uh, in person uh, at the one. museum and we could talk more about birds and maybe even take a walk in Central Park. That would yeah. be lovely, yes. It's nice to- Good night, Peter. Good night, Rosemary. Good night. Right. Thank, Thank you, you good night. Much.